When I was a child, I wanted to be an explorer. Now, I'm a physicist, and don't get me wrong, I love what I do, but I've always been fascinated by what I view as one of humanity's most fundamental prevailing instincts, to push out into the unknown and see what there is to see. Our history, from the very birth of civilization, is filled with explorers, these romantic figures who capture our cultural imagination, forging out into the unfilled corners of the map. And I used to believe that those days were mostly behind us. We've filled in all the blank spots on the map, so until we get to the era of interplanetary travel, there's no exploring left to do, right? I believed that until I learned about exactly how little of the universe we understand. I believed it until I learned about what we call dark matter, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to explain the things we don't understand in the universe and tell you about what we're doing to explore them. But before I do that, I thought I should go back and tell you the story so far. The story of how we came to be in a universe full of people, planets, stars, galaxies, and black holes. I'm going to tell you the story of everything. And that story begins with the Big Bang. Now, you may have heard of the Big Bang. It's our current best theory for the way the universe began. And it goes something like this. About 14 billion years ago, all the fundamental particles that would later become you and me and the galaxy were all smooshed together. Then they started expanding, those fundamental particles started combining and made more complex things like atoms. Then those atoms got so close and so hot that they ignited, creating the first stars. Inside those stars, the atoms are smashing into each other and making all kinds of complex, exotic, heavy stuff. And then those stars exploded, scattering all that exotic matter across the universe. Rinse and repeat that cycle for a few billion years, and we arrive at a rocky planet we call Earth. And a few billion years further after that, crawling up out of the primordial ooze on that planet, we have life forms that we call human beings. Now, that's a pretty cool story, right? And it kind of covers everything. I mean, people, planets, stars, galaxies, that's, that's all the stuff there is, right? If we were going to make a map of all the stuff in the universe, well, it wouldn't look like this map of the Earth, but if we were going to break it down based on what's in the universe, it might look something like that. Now, that's a little silly and simplistic, I know, but that's all the stuff there is, right? I'm here to tell you today that that is so far from the whole story. We know now that all that stuff, people, planets, stars, black holes, that makes up 15% of all the matter in the universe. The remainder is what we call dark matter. There's about five times as much of it as there is all the stuff we understand, so we better define that term. Dark matter is actually a highly literal term. We call it dark because it doesn't interact with light, which means we can't see it. And we call it matter because it has mass, it has stuff to it. And there's one other important thing that we know about dark matter, which is that it doesn't interact with the regular matter much at all, which means we can't touch or feel it. How do we know about this stuff? All of our evidence for dark matter so far comes from what are called cosmological observations. This just means we look at the way stuff moves around in space and we try and explain that motion using our mathematical models. And what we found on every scale of cosmology, from the largest galactic superclusters down to much smaller structures like individual galaxies, what we've seen again and again and again is that we can't explain the motion of any of these things with our theory of gravity if we only consider the stuff we can see we have to introduce an enormous amount of invisible matter, and that is the dark matter. Probably the best example of this comes from what are called galactic rotation curves. A galactic rotation curve is just a measure of how fast a galaxy spins as a function of distance from the center. If we were going to look at a galaxy like our own Milky Way, we can count up all the stuff we can see in that galaxy, and from that we can get an estimate of how much mass there is. And if we know how much mass there is, then we know how much gravity there is. And if we know how much gravity there is, we should be able to predict what the galactic rotation curve looks like, how it spins. Because gravity is the main force that governs the way galaxies move. It's the thing that pulls everything in towards the center and holds it there as it rotates around. I'll ask you to focus on the galaxy and the curve on the left for now. If we looked at a galaxy like that, we could count up all the stuff we can see, the stars and planets and such, and we could model what we would expect its rotation curve to look like we would expect it to look like that curve on the bottom left there. See, most of the stuff we can see is concentrated near the center, which means gravity is strongest there. That means that that stuff can spin around really fast. Then the curve goes down because the outer parts of the galaxy have less stuff, so they have less gravity, so they spin a lot slower. At least, that's what we expect. 
But the crazy thing is that in just about every galaxy we look at, it looks much more like that galaxy on the right. Which is to say, the outer parts are spinning way too fast. Take a look at the rotation curve. The outer parts of the galaxy are spinning just as fast as the stuff near the center. Have a look at the outer stars on the right and compare them with the outer stars on the left. They are moving so much faster than we can account for if we only consider the stuff we can see. We have to introduce a huge amount of dark matter, which provides extra gravity and allows those parts to spin faster without being flung off into space. If you spin a ball around on a string, the string has to provide the tension that keeps the ball traveling in a circle. And if you go too fast and the string can't provide enough tension, it'll break and the ball will fly away. In the galaxy, the dark matter provides the extra force that literally holds the galaxy together. And with that, we've kind of arrived at everything we know about dark matter. I mean, we know there's a lot of it and that it has mass and is invisible. And we know it plays a really important role in the way galaxies move and the structure of the universe. And we know one other very important thing, which is that it's all around us. Because we know that the dark matter is concentrated in the outer regions of the galaxy, which means that's exactly where Earth is in the Milky Way. And that means there's a tremendous amount of dark matter passing right through this room, right through our bodies, right now. And we can't see, touch or feel it because it doesn't interact with our matter. This is a whole new blank spot on the map. It's a whole new region to explore. And we've got this weird paradox with dark matter because, as I mentioned, we've got evidence for it on every scale of the universe. The only place we don't have evidence for it is on Earth, in the laboratory. And that's the problem I'm trying to solve. So, how do you go about detecting something <laughs> that you can't see, touch or feel? Well, it depends what you think it's made of, and there are lots of different theories about what the dark matter might be. But if you ask me, the best theory is this particle called the axion. Now, I don't want you to worry about the technical definition on the board there. All you need to know about axions is that they are a really good dark matter candidate. <laughs> there are a few things about axions that make them a great dark matter candidate. The first one is that they come to us from a completely separate area of physics. What I mean by this is we didn't invent axions just to account for the dark matter. I'm not going to go into it, but suffice to say, there's this big problem in physics called the strong CP problem. And so far, the best solution to that problem relies on the introduction of a particle that they called the axion. And when you look at the properties that you expect that axion to have, they match exactly with the properties we want dark matter to have. So it sounds pretty good, right? The axion can solve these two huge problems at once. The axion also has something really, really important, which is a coupling or interaction with photons, which are particles of light that we happen to be amazing at detecting. That means if axions are the dark matter passing through this room in our bodies right now, we have the opportunity to take something that we have no chance of observing in the form of dark matter and convert it into something that we're great at detecting in the form of light. This is where my experiment comes in. At the University of Western Australia, we're building the Oscillating Resonant Group Axion Experiment. But we prefer to call it organ, for short. <laughs> the idea of organ is to exploit this axion-light interaction. It works something like this. The dark matter in the galactic halo, this stuff that we don't know what it is, comes into our detector in the lab and converts into a little flash of light that we can try and see. Now, there are a few things that make these experiments really challenging. The first one is that the strength of these signals, essentially the number and size of these little flashes of light, is unbelievably small. And the way we get around this is by cooling everything in the experiment to a few thousandths of a degree above the coldest possible temperature, absolute zero. The reason we have to do that is that everything is constantly emitting a small amount of light in proportion with how hot it is. Our bodies right now are emitting light, just not at a wavelength we can see with our eyes. If you've ever used a thermal or infrared camera, you know what I'm talking about. And although this amount of light is small, it would still completely destroy our chances of seeing an axion convert into light in this room. The other thing that makes these experiments really challenging is that we don't really know where to look. We have an enormous parameter space to search. Now, I'm going to throw a plot up on the screen to explain what I mean, and it's a bit technical, but I don't want you to be scared, so I'm going to walk you through it. This is the axion parameter space. On the horizontal axis here, we have the axion mass. 
essentially how heavy the particle is, and we don't know, it could be anywhere from over there to over there. And this is a problem, because when you build one of these experiments, you have to choose what range of axion masses you want to be sensitive to. You can't be sensitive everywhere at once. On the vertical axis, we have the strength of the axion-photon interaction. It's essentially the probability that an axion inside our detector will convert into light that we can see. Now, this is getting a bit technical, so don't think about this as a plot. I want you to think about it as a map. This is a map of all the places the axion could possibly be. This is the map that we have to explore. And all of these bars and lines and stuff are just places that other intrepid adventurers have already explored and ruled out. And if you ask us at the organ experiment, as far as we're concerned, X marks the spot. That's where we think we're most likely to find axion dark matter, so that's where we're building our experiment. And with my research, it's my job to build the detectors that will allow us to access that part of the parameter space. If you like, it's up to me to build the ship that's going to get us there. And it just so happens I've brought one of these ships along with me. This is the detector that we're going to use to detect axion dark matter in the lab. This is the ship we're going to use to voyage and explore the cosmos. Now take a look at this thing. It is tiny. It fits in the palm of my hand, but it is amazingly powerful. With this little thing, we can get some big information. This tiny device can help us learn about the largest structures in the universe. And it's all happening right here in Perth, WA. Why do we care about this? Why is this stuff important? That's a fair enough question. So if you're wondering, let me give you something to think about. Human beings have done some truly, truly amazing things. When you consider the fact that we're a bunch of barely evolved apes clinging to a rock, hurtling through space, and that in a cosmological sense, we've been around for a frankly insignificant amount of time, the things we can do are nothing short of wondrous. Computers, modern medicine, spaceflight, art and literature, on top of all that, the things we've been able to learn about the universe at large are simply astounding. We know how planets form. We know about the black holes at the centers of galaxies. We even know a little bit about the birth of the universe itself. And all of this without any human ever having traveled further than our own moon. These are the things humans have accomplished with knowledge of 15% of the matter in the universe. Imagine what we could do if we could unlock the rest. Thank you. <laughs>